everybody, this is Raul for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have the great honor and privilege of uh, having a chance to chat with Joe Wallace, who is coming to us from New York. Um, Joe is coming off of a national tour where he's been playing with Newsies, and uh, we'll get into a little, we'll talk about that a little bit, but let's get started, Joe. Thanks for taking time to spend a little bit of your, of your day with us. Let's get to know you. Tell us about yourself. How did it all get started? Well, I um, started mu my musical journey um, with piano, actually, at the age of six. And I studied piano for a while. And I was into it, but I didn't take it that seriously, probably because of my age. And then uh, around the time when I was 12, a, a neighborhood friend asked if I played bass. And he was a guitar player. And he was like, you know, we, we need a bass player for our band. And at the time, I only had a keyboard with a bass patch on it, you know, a bass sample. So I brought that over, and it turned out it was actually louder than their amplifiers, my keyboard. I mean, we were so young, we had such crappy equipment. But uh, it definitely piqued my interest of what bass was, and I did a little more research on my own and went out, and uh, my father and I bought a bass together. And I taught myself... Um, the, kind of the basic technique of electric bass. I, I knew how to read music at this point, so it was a natural progression where I could kind of put the two together, but I don't think I really got serious about bass until high school when I joined the um, our jazz band. We didn't really have much of a music program at my high school, but um, uh, it was good enough for me to kind of put the two together where I could learn to read and then also really kind of flesh out how to play the bass with a group of people. And that all that experience, um, junior and senior year in high school, kind of just inspired me to move forward and kind of pursue music professionally in college. And um, I picked up the double bass the summer before college and studied with this amazing teacher, Linda McKnight, at Montclair State University. And she really set me on the right track in terms of technique and foundation and uh, just in terms of practicing the right practice ethic and what really needed to be done in order to succeed with the instrument. And um, after college, I, um, well, rather in college, I studied classical double bass with her and uh, kept up with electric on my own and would do a lot of just whatever I could get my hands on, playing with um, my friends outside of, outside of college, playing in college with a lot of different groups, the orchestra, jazz combos. Etc. And uh, I found myself really interested in playing all types of music, not just classical music. And um, after college, I, I actually received my degree in music education and I taught um, strings for fifth and sixth graders in Franklin Township, New Jersey. And uh, that was a wonderful job, but unfortunately, budget cuts led to me being dismissed and laid off from the job. So I transitioned from that um, to New York City and uh, lived off the unemployment money for some time. I, I joke about it and call it like an artist grant. Sure. Um, but uh, I did that and just kind of tried to meet as many people as I could and take as much low pay work or just work that no one else wanted to do and build a network that way. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of led me through a lot of different uh, events and different shows and meeting different people to where I am now. Gotcha. And how did how did you transition and, and from how did you kind of get your foot in the door with a show like like Newsies? I I know I've I've read there's a couple of books actually dedicated to being a bassist in New York City. It's it's city specific, yeah. and they're you know they they have salient points like have a reliable car, have you know reliable gear. Uh, don't don't be an ass. Um, right. <laughs> it seems like some pretty simple rules, but it also is kind of like because there are more musicians than there are opportunities, they're like, you know, talk to somebody who's in the pit at a show, let them know you can sub, you know, kind of squeeze your way in somehow. And how did that happen for you? How did you... Well, it's kind of, yeah, all those things you mentioned are right. They're, they're definitely important. Um, but the Newsies came to me kind of uh, a lineage of events where I had met a um, music, I had met a drummer at a regional theater gig I had done. Um, and I was at a theater called Barrington Stages, and I met this drummer 
who then introduced me to a music director who was doing a demo session for a composer for an off-Broadway show. And through that, I was brought in to do the off-Broadway show, which introduced me then to the contractor for Newsies. And a year after the off-Broadway show had closed, the contractor gave me a call, and uh, that's kind of, you know, then the tour happened. And um, But it's really, I mean, I think what that illustrates is that relationships are probably one of the biggest keys to getting in, Absolutely. so to speak. Um, knowing people, and I don't mean just like uh, cold networking where you just kind of call everyone and and uh, hope for the best, but rather like kind of trying to show a general interest in what people in people's lives and doing the best you can on every gig you have because because you brought up a good point. There are a lot of musicians and there aren't that there aren't a, uh, a ton of gigs anymore. So every every gig kind of counts, no matter how big or small. Sure. Well, and even when those books went up, they had talked a lot about like studio work, and and nowadays. So many people are producing, you know, at home. You know, right. you, you've got a computer. You, it, you're gone are the days of hour after hour of studio time because who wants to, you know, spend money on a studio when you could probably, you know, you can master something kind of on your own and, you know, you connect with a production company that will get your CDs out there and who's to say where it was produced. I mean, you know, garage or super studio it's, it's sometimes it's kind of hard you know to differentiate and i think the the key thing also is being a workable musician where they they knew they could depend on you they know that you you were not a difficult person <laughs> to be with and again it's 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 always kind of wild because you hear i think it, it comes up time and time again when we talk to musicians that are working and they're you know they're doing well a lot of it has to do with a really just a really good attitude, you know, and they 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 have not been difficult to to function with, and it's been kind of a chain of events where they were with playing with somebody who put in a good word and said, hey, yeah, this guy's okay, and 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 so forth and so forth. So that said, with with newsies, which again I don't know that everybody's acquainted, you probably. Like myself, I'm, I've, I've caught bits and pieces of it on, you know, Saturday afternoon on Homebox or something. But this is kind of an interesting phenomena in that it was a movie first, and then it was made into like a Broadway kind of production. So it went to the stage after being a movie where so many were on stage first and then were, were turned into a movie to bring it out to the masses. Um do you play both electric and upright with um, Newsies? Uh, with Newsies, the show is actually just five string electric. Gotcha. Um, and the Newsies was a musical movie when it was first released. And um, I think what had happened was people were doing productions of it that weren't licensed officially through Disney. And so Disney said, why don't we release our own production, stage production of this movie musical? And they did that. They released it at Paper Mill Playhouse in New Jersey, and that did incredibly well. And then they extended it to a Broadway limited run that did very well. And it ran for two years on Broadway, and the tour did incredibly well after the Broadway show had closed. And now the plan, I believe, is that Disney is releasing it for regional productions all across the country. And I think when they made up their closing announcement, they also included in that announcement that it was going to open in 17 different regional theaters. So I, I think that was the plan all along, which is smart business, you know, in my mind. But, um, yeah, the show is just five-string electric, although there are a lot of passages I definitely could hear uh, double bass, like Arco and that kind of thing. But I think they chose Danny Trube, the orchestrator, chose five-string electric to kind of con keep it contemporary sounding. Gotcha. Uh, and match the uh, movie soundtrack a I little see. more. I see. And it's an interesting point because somebody else was mentioning, and we, we run into this. I, I don't know if you hear much about it. The ongoing dispute about more than four strings when it comes to a bass. But what is apparently in a lot of demand is five strings. Oh, most definitely. And especially in a lot of the contemporary musical theater work I end up doing, um, 
they want most composers want five strings they like the lower notes um it kind of adds a sense of drama when you drop the b string uh or stuff in that octave lower and um and you drop it tastefully and then i think in most wedding bands now it's actually expected that you have a five string uh people tend to get a little vibey i think if you get bring in a six string but i mean if you're musical with your instrument, you're musical. I, it, to me, I, I try not to. I try to see it objectively, not let too much personal taste get into whatever instrument someone wants to bring to a gig. You know. Absolutely. Well, it it turns into almost a purist kind of philosophy, right. and uh, you know, it's it's different different tastes for different kinds of music, and you know, it's a it's another tool, and depending on the job you have at hand, then the right tool is the tool you have. Um, one of the, the, the bassists for Journey, Ross Valerie, actually plays a four string, but he tunes it to low B. So uh, when we talked about that, he basically said he would love to play a five string, but his hands are kind of on the small side. So he right. has to have a more narrow neck, but he wants the lower octave. Uh, and that's what works for him, you know? And so that's okay. Right, right, Since, I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. Since we're mentioning gear, tell us a little bit about the tools that you are using. What what are you using for gear? Um, well, my main my main base is a five string precision um, American standard that I really love. Um, I also have a 70, 1975 Fender P bass with flat wounds on it, mm -hmm. uh, Labella flat wounds. I have on that five string. I have the Labella round wounds, which I also really like. I also have a um, at the end of the tour, they, they wanted me to kind of change the sound a little bit to more of a modern thing that cut a little more. So I picked up a Ibanez sound gear, which I, I'm actually shocked at how, how good it sounds. Um, for an instrument at that price point, you know, people kind of are like, well, it's not going to really sound that great. But it actually went, went off really well. And with the DI we were using, uh, it uh, sounded great in the mix. So... Um, I also have a double bass, and then I generally bring along a Ready uh, Red Di, which is designed, which is made by A Design, sure. and um, that's just a big old box with a high fidelity radio tube in it. And I love how that kind of warms up the sound, and it's supposed to emulate uh, kind of like the B15 Ampeg B15, mm -hmm. but uh, I just it adds like just uh, extra warmth and. Um, I usually bring that along for my live gigs just in case the sound guy has a DI that I may not be a fan of. Um, but there's plenty of other things I've tried that I don't own that I love too, like the Tone Hammer by Aguilar. Um, Nobel preamps are great too, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And But yeah, I don't have a ton of basses like some, other, some of my bass playing friends do. Some people have like 10 basses and I just... I'm pretty happy with my Fender basses. I do want to maybe pick something custom up eventually, but that time isn't right now. So I got gotcha. you. Well, it's it seems like many bassists are in the perennial search for the perfect instrument, and it is a dynamic situation because what could be just right for you when you're 14 wouldn't be necessarily right for you when you're you know, 24 or 34 or 44. Um, I, was ch I was chatting with Chuck Rainey, and the key thing, one of the key things about his bass is the weight. Because mm -hmm. as he's gotten older, he's like, I'm not playing a heavy bass anymore. So I want <laughs> it needs to be light and comfortable for me because I'm just not going to do a heavy instrument. And... We picked up, especially at the last NAMM show, I picked up some of these instruments that were just massively heavy. And I'm kind of going, oh my gosh, you know, if you had to play you know, for hours, you know, you, you'd probably have like paresthesia of your left hand just by the, the weight and the strap and all that, you know. And right. You kind of expect that with some of the more stringed instruments, like a six uh, mm -hmm. because of wider neck and more wood and whatnot and whatnot. But, um, you know, looking for those characteristics, looking how it resonates, you know, just kind of, if you're lucky enough to find what works for you, you know, that's good. You know, I, I think that's better than just having to search forever and never quite having it, you know? Um, yeah. And what you, you mentioned you had been, do you still teach? Uh, I don't teach uh, 
at, right at this moment. I do. I am interested in giving private lessons. I did that for a while after I was let go from the public school I was working at. Gotcha. But um, as of right now, I'm just I, I'm really focused on performing, and uh, no one has really asked for lessons, so it's fine. There yeah. you go. And what what's in the future? What what plans do you have? What's what's coming up? Well, I, I, you know, I've been busy since uh, since I've been back. I got back October third, and I actually had a few pretty nice gigs. Um, I started my church gig back up, which is kind of like a contemporary Christian thing. Um, I also had a chance to perform at Carnegie Hall with a great uh, orchestra. Um, that was with this group called the Mimesis Ensemble, and we we performed two pieces: Benjamin Britten. Um, something by Benjamin Britten and then another piece by uh, Arabic composer Mohammed Farouz. And uh, they, it was a wonderful experience. Um, I, I played with that group at another room in Carnegie. This was in the main auditorium, the Stern Auditorium. And it was interesting because I hadn't had my double bass with me on Newsies. So I had to really kind of just hit the ground running as soon as I got back and really work out my chops and like get get the bow going again. And I, I mean, I loved it. I loved get, diving right back in, but um, leading a bass section uh, with two weeks be, after being on tour for two years is certainly a tall order, but it, it turned out great, and uh, the bass section was wonderful, and I had a great time with it. Um, as for gigs coming up, there's a club I play at usually called 54 Below. Um, it's a cabaret club in Manhattan, and I have a few dates there. I've been doing, I had a couple wedding dates, uh, just this past week. So things have been pretty busy and I hope it continues that way. But um, the idea is just to continue to foster relationships, meet new people and um, continue to have fun. I mean, that's the wonderful thing about New York is there's always new people to meet and you know, can always reconnect with old, old friends and other players and see what they're up to. And there's always so much great music happening. It's, it's kind of endless. So it's, it's wonderful to be a musician in New York. Absolutely. And you touched on something which I think is another fascinating thing, and that is part of the cultural melting pot that you have in New York. And I, I find, you know, certainly world music, it's, it's great. We get things sent to us from all over the world, but to have compositions that'll use more of an Arabic uh, scale and, and approach and interesting time signatures and things that go beyond I mean, it, it just enriches the vocabulary of all of this, and you can have it right at hand. And I, I think that's, you know, just just fabulous. But it's also challenging, you know. Do, do you, do you, obviously, you're very well prepared to jump into stuff like that because I know for a lot of people that's very difficult, you know, to handle. Yeah, I mean, it's, again, the more you can expose yourself to different things, the uh, the more familiar new challenges will be to you because I, I heard something once is that there's no difficult music just unfamiliar music and so the more you can expose yourself to different players or different ideas the more the broader your scope will be and the less daunting things will seem mm -hmm. I mean at the end of the day it's the effort you put in and what you're will the time you're willing to spend on trying to make the piece sound how it should gotcha. um, that but yeah, and being in New York just it really allows allows you to put yourself out there as much as you want, and um, you can be you can still be out till four in the morning playing music or hearing music. You just kind of have to know where to look now, as opposed to it just kind of being all out there. Um, it's certainly even very different in the short amount of time that I've lived here, and not that's not even to mention twenty years ago, thirty years ago. I mean, it's a completely different place now. Well, it's been super, again, getting a chance to have this insight into your world of bass. Um, looking forward to future projects and, and hearing more from you. And, and when you do have something, don't forget to, to let us know. Because, again, we always kind of stay in touch. And that is kind of great. Go look at what Joe's got going on or something. And certainly, if you're in our neck of the woods uh, make sure to stop by and, and, and say hey. So with that, thanks, Joe, for your time. You've seen this interview here on Bass Musician Magazine. Thanks, Raul. Cheers.